Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We are glad that you have chosen on this very, very cold Sunday morning to come together and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. We are glad that you're here. We welcome you here. Hope that you have felt welcome in coming into this place this morning. Also hope that you received an order of worship on the way in. Um, I just got to say something about an order of worship. Uh, you probably, maybe if you've been here before, you've heard me say an order of worship is like a road map, and sometimes we take detours. Today's a complete mess. Uh, and it's Sarah's fault. How'd that bus feel, Sarah? I just threw you, and I'm... We're, ch <laughs> we're changing, we, we are changing up one song, and then we're just completely changing the whole order. So pretty much after... The passing of the peace, everything just goes to snot, to be honest with you. Um, so you're good. You're good with the order of worship until passing of the peace. After that, you can just draw on it or put your gum in it, whatever. But anyway, we are glad you're here. We welcome you here. Um, a couple of things I do want to point out to you in way of announcements. I'm not going to read all this to you because that bores me and it probably bores you also. Um, New Beginning Circle, you guys are meeting tomorrow evening. Um, the, the bulletin says 6.30, but we're going to meet a little earlier at 6. That way, um, ladies are not getting home so late from the new beginning circle. So just make that, if you're part of that ladies' circle, um, we'll be meeting at 6 p.m., not 6.30. Also, uh, Children's Advisory Team, who works with our children's ministry and Ms. Carroll, you guys are meeting today at 3 o'clock, just a reminder there. Um, also, a reminder, our youth are leaving next Friday for a youth retreat. Be going through Monday. Be going to Tennessee, correct? Uh, so we've uh, praying for traveling mercies for them guys, for those guys, and also praying that, that God will work in their hearts and their minds that weekend. Um, today, immediately following worship, if you're a part of a committee of the church, which means if I've called you and said, hey, will you serve on such and such committee, or will you do such and such ministry in the church, if you will stay after worship, you can meet up front here to my right. Um, and as I've said to some folks already uh, individually this morning, the quicker we gather and sit and are quiet, I sound like a school teacher now, right? The quicker we sit, gather, and are quiet, the quicker we get out of here. I said we'll be out of here by one, but I anticipate we can be out of here even sooner than that. Um, it's just a, a setup introduction. Should not take very long at all. And then the final thing, um, when you walk into the church, you see a variety of symbols. You see a baptismal font, you see a table. Don't, this is for the sermon, so you don't always see this. But you see a table, you see a cross, you see candles. You see all types of symbols, and those symbols mean something. It's kind of churchy stuff. If you're unfamiliar with what all this churchy stuff means, or if you want to have a reminder of what all this churchy stuff is about, um, for the next three Sundays, starting next Sunday, your bulletin is wrong. Uh, again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a road map. We take detours. Um, it's a typo. But uh, beginning next Sunday, January 14th, then 21st and 28th, um, in here on Sunday mornings beginning at 10 o'clock, I'm going to do a little 30, 35-minute session about some of this churchy stuff. Um, if you're already in a Sunday school class, and, and, and I'm not saying bail in your class by no means, um, but if this stuff is of interest to you, I will be here the next three Sundays at 10 a.m. just to offer some introduction information about the churchy stuff that we have every week or almost every week here in worship. Um, Eric Daly, if you would, you have a word to share with us, please, sir. Good morning. This is the first Sunday in the year of our Lord, 2018. It sounds better when you say the year of our Lord. It is a privilege to be here with you today. Before, you, before I tell you all about a new ministry, I ask that we pray just a li little together. Father God, we are too busy 
and we can forget that we are not on this journey alone. Sometime during this past week, some children in this community were brought into the, this world to healthy family surroundings. Praise you, Lord God. Others became foster children due to their parents' addictions or neglect. There are over 4,000 foster children in South Carolina. We pray for these foster children, Lord. Sometime during this past week, some folks in our county were given good news by their doctors that the test results were all they had prayed for. Praise you, Lord God. Others were alerted to some very serious, potentially life-changing illnesses. We pray for these, our neighbors, Lord. Sometime during this past week, some of our neighbors were notified that they did get a, that new job, that new promotion, that exciting new position, and a new start. Praise you, Lord God. Others were told that their business was being purchased, that there will be layoffs or their operations moving elsewhere. We pray for these, our neighbors, Lord. Sometime during this past week, there were those in the community who took their last drink, swallowed their last pill, or injected the last substance and have overcome their addictions. Praise to you, Lord God. Others had their habits overtake them and they're now in a new terrible cycle of dependency and hardship. We pray for these, our neighbors, Lord. Sometime during this past week, families were surrounded by love and peace and kindness. Praise to you, Lord God. Some of our neighbors suffered, suffered abuse and neglect, both physical and mental. We pray for these, our neighbors, Lord God. Some families have wrecked reconnected over the holidays and created new bonds in love. Praise to you, Lord God. Other families have fractured with separation and divorce and hurt. We, praise, we pray for these families, Lord. These are our neighbors. Some of our neighbors are here with us today, worshiping with us in this joyful and holy place. Praise to you, Lord God. Others have drifted off to other pursuits. We pray for all those apart from us today, Lord. All of these weekly events are part of the fabric of life. Our prayers, prayers today, dear Lord, are for both those you've blessed, that they know you are the source of their blessings, and for the challenge that they, they know you are there while they face these challenges. We thank you, God, for Grace United Methodist Church, its pastor, his team, and our prayer team, that they are equipped to minister to all these, our neighbors. We thank you, God, for the gifts in this church in Abbeville. We are thankful for the dedicated service of many here. Help us to further this service, Lord, to the benefit of all we meet. We ask all these things through the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We're kicking off a new ministry. Grace has for some time outsourced the church cleaning and the lawn care. Give or take, the total cost of these services is over $13,000 a year. Our current weekly cleaning duties include some vacuuming, trash collection, work in the lavatories and the kitchen, and attention paid to the offices and the sanctuary. Our lawn is mowed as often as necessary, but somewhere around 15 times between March and late fall. We're gonna bring these duties inside. Perhaps Sunday school classes could keep their classrooms tidy. Others may agree to take out the trash. We could enlist teams to adopt rooms or wings of the building to be under their care. We hope that people gravitate to what they love to do and by taking on the duties they love, their joy will show in their performance. Volunteers could specialize on duties instead of areas, vacuuming as a specialty, cleaning lavatories, kitchen care, etc. Outside, we could have groups armed with edgers, weed eaters, and mowers to team up for each mowing event. Five teams uh, would only have to mow three times per year. A mowing event with a three-member team may require several hours. The $13,000 per year we save is a gift of this ministry back to this church, which may cause you to ask why. 
Those who inspire us are the people who've made the world a better place or who have made somebody's world a better place. Nobody is going to change the whole world, but everybody at Grace has the potential to change someone's world. There are dozens of people in this sanctuary who have already made someone's world better, and God has not forgotten. Will God bless Grace United Methodist Church more if we give hard-earned dollars to cleaning and landscaping vendors? Or, or do our dollars go farther in the hands of a dedicated pastor, a dedicated youth pastor, a dedicated worship director, and a dedicated director of the children's ministry? If we shift this money back to our ministries while laboring and praying at the same time over this campus in full measure, are we not furthering God's mission for all the souls we prayed for at the outset of this message? More compassion, more pastoral care, more souls drawn to God's kingdom while asking God to bless and multiply it all. James tell, tells us, come near to God and he will come near to you. Our teamwork, our stewardship, our care for this campus, God's blessings. Francis Chan has said, I don't want Jesus to return and find me sitting in a theater. Just think of the Almighty turning his gaze our way to see our congregation teaching a wee one about Jesus or turning a young person's attention to God's peace or pushing a vacuum around the sanctuary. Let's start 2018 with an attitude of gratitude for our pastor and his team and this beautiful facility that God has blessed us with. You have no idea what hangs in the balance of your decision to embrace the inspiration God puts in your heart. Our entire staff and prayer team have already embraced the inspiration God has placed in their hearts, and they're making a difference in this community every day. God has a way of blessing those who hear his call. When God blessed the building of this church nearly 10 years ago, he did not provide this house of prayer only to be given our passing interest. He considers this church his and in this community holy, and we honor God with our care and our thankfulness for this facility. When we prayerfully clean and maintain this holy campus, is this not another form of worship? Armed with vacuums, armed with brushes, armed with zero turns, let's team up and clean up. We have sign-up sheets available, and we will meet as soon as we have volunteers. Please pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance and support of this ministry, and then please walk in the light of that guidance. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. Church, I would invite you to stand with me this morning. Maybe you heard me mention earlier about the whole idea of churchy stuff. This is one of those churchy things that we do every week. It's called the Apostles' Creed. And there's a reason why we do it. We remind ourselves the basics, the essentials, the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And it's good to remind ourselves of these things. Let us join together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And I and the worship team, we invite you to remain standing as we begin our worship in song this morning.
Good morning, how everybody doing? Uh, happy New Year to everybody, and, and again, thanks to everybody who blessed me out through the holidays, and let us go to the uh, throne of grace for prayer. Father God, I come to you right now, Father God, the enemy is busy, Father God, he's trying to destroy this church, Father God, with just little stuff. He's trying to divide us and make it something big, Father God, but we know we come to you right now, Father God, that the devil cannot divide this church. This church will come together, and this church will be as one in 2018. Every goal that we have set for 2018, Father God, I pray that it will be completed, Father God, and I know it will, Father God, with the help of our pastor, help of our leaders in this church, we will be on one accord, Father God. No devil in hell can destroy this church, because we will come together. We are stronger together than apart. We are truly stronger together, Grace United Methodist Church, than apart. Let us pray the prayer that God gave us to pray. Our Father, we dwell in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, give us our trespasses. As we forget those who trespass against us, lead us not in temptation, but the us. Moment, greet those around you, welcome them to grace.
may be seated. Let us continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering. We have a chance to give back a portion of what is God's with God's tithe and, and to have the potential to go beyond the giving of that tithe and to, to give an offering. And we do this not because God needs it. We give because we need to give. It's our response to God's great love for us and how God greatly provides for us every day. And God asks us to give, again, not because God needs it, but because we need it, and it reminds us where our ultimate trust and faith comes from. It doesn't come from money. It doesn't come from anything this world has to offer. Our ultimate trust and faith is in the one who created this world, God through his son, Jesus Christ. And in our giving, we know, I know, I would imagine you know too because you've seen it firsthand, lives transformed by people of this church sharing the good news of Jesus. It's happening every day. And oh, by the way, next Sunday, our own Kimberly is going to share for a few minutes about her mission trip to Nicaragua because we helped fund her to go and lives were changed. And her life was changed. So when we give, lives are changed by the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's why we exist. Let us pray together. God, you are good. As the scriptures remind us, you are good and your love endures forever. God, your love is beyond our imagination. That you would love us unlovable people so much that you would send your only son. The greatest gift ever given. Lord, may we respond back and our love for you and how we give. To be a cheerful giver and to know that it's all through you that we have anything that we call our own. And Holy Spirit, I pray that everything given and received in this place today would be blessed and multiplied by you, Holy Spirit. The Lord God, it would go further than we've ever imagined, further in terms of sharing the love and grace of Jesus with so many people from Abbeville to across this world. May it change people's lives by how Grace United Methodist Church gives. In your holy name we do pray. Amen. You know, Jason just said in the prayer, y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess already. <laughs> this song that we're doing, he just said that, God, you're good. And there's a part of this song that says, um, you are good, you are good, Lord, you are good. And, um, this is a song that we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. It's called King of My Heart. And, you know, I had it sent to me a couple of times. Kimberly first brought it to me, you know, about a month or so ago. And she said, Sarah, you need to listen to this song. I listened to it, but I didn't really, really listen to it. And I had a friend of mine out of the blue. She sent it to me again. Um, she texted it to me about a week or so ago and was like, Sarah, I, um, I need you to listen to this song. She's like, I feel it, that it was put in my heart. God put it in my heart to send it to you. And so finally I was like, all right, yeah, this, that's pretty cool. You know, twice in a, a month I've gotten this song from two different people. And I listened to it, and I, I sent her back a text. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a great song. I just listened to it not long ago, and it's a, you know, it's a good song. It's awesome. And she's like, no, Sarah, did you really listen to this song? I was like, yeah. She's like, no. She knows how hard-headed I am. She said, did you really listen to it? And I was like, okay, I'll listen to it again. And when I did, it's like, Okay, duh, that's what this means. <laughs> but um, it talks about letting God be the king of our hearts, um, being the wind inside ourselves, being the anchor in our waves, being our song, um, being the fire inside of our veins, the echo of our days. He is our song. And I think that God's just reminding me of that, and I think that he was saying, hey, you know, bring it to grace. I think it needs to be a song that we do, and I think it needs to be a um it needs to be something for us all, and it needs to be a reminder for us all. So just listen to the words of this. Really listen to the words of this, as I was told. So um, this is King of My Heart. Let 
Let us now stand as we present God's tithes and our offerings.
can be seated. And children can be dismissed for Children's Church. Good morning. Today's, <laughs> today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. This is the word of God for the people of God. I have a confession to make. Not that kind of confession. I'm not much of a gardener. I'm not much of a gardener at all. You know, there's some folks you've probably heard or even said, or maybe you are that person that you have a green thumb. You ever heard that expression? Like, man, they just have a green thumb. If you were to look at me, you would, in, in anything that I would try to plant, you would think he has a brown thumb or a black thumb because every time he tries to plant something, it just dies. And I even began to think, you know what? Sometimes I have a hard time keeping an artificial plant looking decent, much less anything alive. See, and I think part of the reason why I'm such a bad gardener is because I don't want to put the work in prior to planting. In other words, I don't want to take the time that it takes to prepare the ground before anything is ever else done. In other words, I don't really want to take the time to prepare the ground for stronger roots. See, I think back to myself as, as a young boy. I had a grandfather who every year planted a garden. Papa Lalas. Cal Lalas. He had one of the best gardens around in Honeypath. And part of the reason why is because the work that he spent prior to ever planting, the work that he spent getting the ground ready for stronger roots. As an adult, as a father, as a father of two boys, there's been numerous occasions I've watched my two boys in a field with their grandfather, Pop, as he is on a tractor plowing, and they get a little nervous when it's plowing season, and here's why, because they wait on the phone to ring to say, Stephen, Brady, I need y'all to come over to the field I'm plowing, and I need y'all to pick up rocks and sticks and roots that are in the way. And they try to think of every excuse they can. Sometimes those excuses work. But other times, Amber and I remind the boys, boys, you need to go because that's life lessons you'll never forget. If you look up front this morning, you'll see on this wooden pestle rocks and a root. Those actually came from one of the fields that Boyd had plowed. And I would imagine one of the boys had chunked those rocks to the side because they are around the gate. I just had to walk around the gate and pick up what I wanted because they had already chunked them to the side. See, there's something to be said about preparing the ground for stronger roots, for getting stuff out of the way so that roots can take hold and grow and produce more fruit. And so today, for the next few Sundays, we're going to be in a sermon series for the month of January entitled Roots. Stronger roots equal more fruit. Stronger roots equal more fruit. And the verse you heard Brother Tim read just a few moments ago is going to be our theme verse. So I hope that by the end of this, we will have that one verse partially, if not completely, memorized from John 15 verse 5. But here's what I've, else I've come to learn about gardening. What's true about gardening is also true about living. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to produce fruit in our lives. And, and think about this idea of producing fruit, because you heard read from John 15, 5, you are to bear fruit. The idea of producing fruit another way is saying this is that you live out and do something with the faith that you claim. Did you hear me? 
The faith that you claim is your own. You live it out and you do something with it. See, this faith that we have in Jesus Christ is not a faith that's supposed to be kept to ourselves. It's one that's supposed to be shared. A faith that's only kept to yourself and not shared doesn't do a whole lot of good for the world. A faith that's kept to yourself and not shared, you're not going to make disciples, period. And that's what Jesus has told us to do. You see, if, if we want our relationship with God to grow, maybe, maybe, you know, in 2018, you made a resolution. I don't know. Somebody asked me this morning, did you make any resolutions? I said, no, because I don't want to set myself up for failure. But maybe, maybe you made a resolution this year. Maybe you said, I want my relationship with God to grow. Or maybe it's that we want this church to grow in its relationship with God. And if either of those are the case, and I, I pray that both of those are the case, that you want your relationship with God to grow, and you want this church to grow in relationship with God, the only way that's going to happen is for us to return to our roots because stronger roots equals more fruit. Stronger roots equals more fruit. And here's the thing, Grace. I believe Grace United Methodist Church, we are more spiritually healthy than we've been in a long time. Part of that has to do with the powerful work of the prayer team and seeking out the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place day after day after day after day. Amen. Amen. And while we're thinking about the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, we're just a bunch of people gathered in a room listening to some goofy guy talk. We need the Holy Spirit's presence in this place. If we don't, we have no power. If we don't, any hope of ever producing fruit is futile. So with that said, Grace, this year, let's grow our roots stronger than ever. Beginning today, again, beginning today and for the next three weeks, we're going to be in this series, Roots, Stronger Roots Equal More Fruit. And just to kind of give you a road map of where we're heading, today we're going to talk about the greatest. And the greatest is love. The Apostle Paul said it, Jesus said it, the greatest is love. And then after that following, we're going to talk about some more roots in the Christian faith. Giving, serving, and going. But we've got to start at the beginning today with the greatest. The greatest is love. And as we begin this new year in ministry and mission as a body of believers, as a local church, we must return to love. And maybe you're thinking, love. That's all you ever talk about is love. That's what Jesus talked a lot about too, by the way, love. Also money, but we don't ever want to talk about that. So today we're going to talk about love, okay? And here's your takeaway. If there's one main point I want you to know when you leave this place is this. If we don't get this right, then we get it all wrong. In other words, if we don't get this, meaning love, if we don't get this right, then we get it all, in caps, all wrong. So today we're going to look at one of the most familiar teachings of Jesus. In fact, it's one of the most familiar teachings of Jesus for church people. If you've come to Grace at least more than once, you've already heard me say this more than once. Because I say it at least once a week. And in the midst of this being the most familiar passage for church people, the midst of me saying this at least once a week, here's a reality check for us, church. This passage is really one of the most difficult passages to process. The passage we're about to read is one of the most difficult passages to process. And here's the deal, and here's why. With Jesus and reading the words of Jesus, sometimes the most difficult things to process are not what we do not understand, but the very words that we do understand. Because they convict us so, we think, really? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screen. If you have a phone or a tablet with you, you can follow along on that. But again, remember, as we read these words, if we don't get this right, then we get it all wrong. So we're starting with the greatest. Matthew 22, picking up in verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Again, one church folks probably familiar with, but if we're honest with ourselves, it's probably one of the most difficult passages from Jesus. And here's why. Matthew tells us Jesus had just finished up a conversation with the Sadducees. So what does that mean? What's what's Matthew talking about? If you read prior, you'll see the religious leaders, the religious group called the Sadducees, were testing Jesus. They, They had already begun to test him about something. They're trying to get Jesus to say something that will incriminate himself. Jesus, in in all of Jesus' godly wisdom, does not incriminate himself with that, with the Sadducees questioning. So Matthew says the Pharisees, seeing that Jesus has silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees team up and say, all right, let's see if we can get it. See, the Pharisees focused heavily on the Old Testament law. All 613 laws, by the way. And for the Pharisees to violate one of those, you violate them all. And for the Pharisees to claim one law is greater than the other is a catastrophe and blasphemous, and you just don't do that because they are all together equal. And so they're setting up Jesus to say, all right, teacher, what do you think is the greatest law? What do you think is the greatest commandment? And see, Jesus aware that they're trying to set him up, replies. And before we go back to the reply, did you hear it the first time we read it? The outcome of this discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees in this context provides for a positive time of teaching. What's significant about that? The whole motivation behind it was nothing but hostility. The Pharisees were wanting to come at him with a hostile attitude. What does that mean for us? Often people see a better picture of real love in hostile situations and how we react to someone else's hostility. When someone comes at you angry, mean, what would happen if we responded in a loving way? What would happen if we respond and not react? See, and that's what Jesus did. He responded. And again, we got to remember that if Jesus says something the slight bit, a slight bit off cue, that he can be charged with, 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 with blasphemy. He can be charged with trying to destroy the law. But if we remember earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill it. I've come to make it whole. And so Jesus responds. And he responds to the Pharisees by quoting an Old Testament passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6. See, these Pharisees knew this passage quite well. It's what's come to be known as the Shema. It's a reminder for pious Jews. Pious Jews will repeat these words at least twice a day. And so when Jesus says these words to the Pharisees, they're not surprised. When Jesus says, the greatest, you shall, he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now we hear that and we think heart, soul, mind. What does that mean? Here's the reality. Heart, soul, and mind are not to be seen as different parts of who you are. Different, but they are to be seen as different ways of thinking about our relationship with God and how we relate to God. In other words, what Jesus is saying is you love God with all that you are. With your entire being, you love God with all that you are. You put God ahead of everything else because God is primary. If you can't put God ahead of everything else, you're not loving God with all that you are. If God is not your first priority, then God is last, in other words. And so Jesus says, here it is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on, he says, and the second is like it. Then he quotes from Leviticus 19. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there's something significant when he says, and the second is like it. What Jesus is saying is these two two commands, these two laws of love, they stand together. They can't be separated. You can't say, I'm going to love God, I'm not going to love my neighbor. You can't say, I'm going to love my neighbor and I'm not so sure about this God thing. They go together. You cannot separate them. And neither is to be raised above the other. The parallel. Hopefully you've heard me say before, and I will repeat again, as I've said, I don't have anything new to say. I just repeat myself a lot. If 
if we're having a hard time loving our neighbor, we probably need to check our relationship with our God. Did you hear me? If you're having a hard time loving your neighbor the way you love yourself, you probably need to check your relationship and how you're loving God. Because they go hand in hand. The disciple John wrote a letter. One of the letters he wrote in 1 John chapter 4, he pretty much says you can't say you love God and don't love your neighbor because if you do, you're a liar. They go hand in hand. You can't separate them. And then Jesus, Jesus ends this conversation with the Pharisees. He ends it with verse 40 that we read. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Again, a reminder all the way back to Matthew 5 when Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. If you want to keep the perfect law of God, Jesus says, love God with all that you are and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. And again, church, if we don't get this right, then we get it all wrong. If we don't start with love as the foundation of all that we are and in all that we do, then we get it all wrong. You see, according to Jesus, everything the church does, everything his disciples do, should be based upon these things. Love of God with your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. Love should be the lens in which we view people and how we treat people. And let's think about this idea of loving your neighbor. See, Luke's gospel set it up in a different way when Jesus was questioned about loving your neighbor. Jesus then told a very, again, familiar story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which really asked us, the church, to ask ourselves the question, why do we keep asking who's my neighbor? Maybe quit looking at who is my neighbor and look at who is God's neighbor. And just an answer to that, that would be all people. Because God invites all people to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. See, this idea of love, that word so misused in the English language. Do you know what it is? We we can love all sorts of things. I love my wife. Man, I love my wife. I love my kids. Man, I love my truck. My truck. I love my dog. I love fried chicken. I love a steak, by the way. Anybody ever wants a grill for me? I love a nice steak, cooked medium, twice baked potato, salad, cheese, croutons. You can keep cucumbers on like that. I like spinach instead of lettuce, so keep that in mind. And good homemade ranch dressing. I love that. See, we, we misuse the word love. So when Jesus is talking about love God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself, it's not an emotional feeling that Jesus is talking about. It's not a feeling of passion. Love is such a vague word. And we hear these words from Jesus, and and you hear me say these words over and over, love God with all that you are, love your neighbor as yourself. And you're like, yeah, that's right, that's right. But when it comes time to loving our neighbor as ourself, oftentimes we back up and retreat because it's so hard to do. Because we think about this word love as an emotion, and it's not an emotion, it's a choosing. It's a decision, it's a commitment that everything we do don't have to have this warm, fuzzy feeling. I'm going to love my enemy, and I ain't going to like it most times, but I'm going to love them because that's what God said to do. Not only did God say do it, that's what God did for me. When I was an enemy to him, he sent his son Jesus Christ down across for all people. That's what God did, and if I'm going to imitate God, if I'm going to imitate my Savior, then I've got to love all people, including the people who hate my guts. I'm going to love them. I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to call them by name. I'm not going to speak bad about them. I'm going to see them in the hallway and say, hey! Good to see you today. Because we're called to love. No matter if we receive that love back or not, we are called to love. You see, really, this love that Jesus calls us to, again, it's not so warm fuzzy. Really, this love Jesus calls us to, if you're taking notes, write it down. If you're not, start taking notes. This love that Jesus calls us to is a stubborn I know we can be stubborn. Let's be stubborn for the right thing. It's a stubborn, unwavering commitment. Do you hear me? The love that Jesus calls his disciples to, if we want stronger roots and more fruit, it starts here. It's this love. It's a stubborn, unwavering commitment to love God with all that I am and love my neighbor as myself. 
And if we don't get this right, we get it all wrong. It starts here. I know, it's getting close. I'm about done. Right on. Over Christmas break, we had family movie night. My family loves to watch movies. I get bored about 30 minutes in most times. But not with this one. I thought I was going to get bored, but I didn't. It was Wonder Woman. That woman kicked some serious behind in that movie. But more than that, I came away with some pretty good thoughts. Here's two of them. She says, Wonder Woman says in the movie, it's not about what you deserve. It's about what you believe, and I believe in love. It's not about what you deserve. It's about what you believe, and I believe in love. We were watching that, and I said, Amber, hit pause, rewind it. I got to put that down in my phone. And we hit play again. Wonder Woman, the prophet, Wonder Woman is playing. Wonder Woman went on. She said this, only love can truly save the world. Then she said, so I fight and I give. Only love can truly save the world, so I fight and I give. See, church, Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches. See, if he's the vine, he's the one we put our roots into. And if we are the branches, we are the ones that he sends us out to bear fruit. See, it's on the screen because some of y'all are starting to nod off because you're getting warm in here. If that's for your neighbor, go throw him the elbow and say, wake up, because Jason wants us to read something with him. I want you to read this verse with me from John 15, verse 5. You ready? Let's say it together. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. See, church, we're called to make disciples. We're called to bear fruit. And I've been guilty of it, and I think the church as a whole, not just this church, but the church as a whole, we've been guilty of focusing so much on the Great Commission that we forget the Great Commandment. So the Great Commission is to go and make disciples, but before we can do that, we've got to focus on the Great Commandment, loving God with all that we are and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Because if we don't get this right, then we get it all wrong. And let us remember our goal in making disciples and our goal as disciples Hear me out. It, our goal is not to, do, to just get more people to come to church. You think, what? Hear me out. Our goal is not to just get more people to come to church. Our goal is to introduce people to the love of God. Do you hear me? Our goal is to introduce people to the love of God. And people can best see the love of God by how we love others. So we can't love others the way we love ourselves unless we are truly loving God with all that we are. So what would be different? What would be different if rather than telling people how bad they are, we tell them how good God's love is? Rather than telling people how bad they are, we told them how good God's love is. And here's what I know about us, church. No matter how hard we work, no matter how great of programs we may develop, if we forget about love, we've lost it all. Let us not forget the greatest. To love God with all that you are and to love your neighbor the way you love yourself. If we don't get this right, we get it all wrong. So as we prepare our hearts and minds to come to the Lord's table, We began with this image of gardening and preparing the soul. See, a lot of us need to prepare our hearts for this new year. 
resolution or no resolution, we need to prepare our hearts from the pulpit all the way back. I'm included in that, okay? From the pulpit all the way back. We need to prepare our hearts better for this new year. And I think we do that by inviting God. Say, so God, let's throw it to you in farming terms. All right, God, he understands, by the way. God, I want you to come till up my heart like a ground is tilled up. I want you to break my heart, God, for what breaks yours. God, I want you to get these rocks and these roots that are just cluttering up my life. I want you to get these rocks and these roots, God, that are cluttering up my heart, that's keeping me from loving you with all that I am, and God, that's keeping me from loving my neighbor as myself, because if I keep this junk in my heart, God, I'm not going to be much use to you, because apart from me, you can do nothing. In a heart full of rocks and roots of hatred, of bitterness, of unforgiveness, that's apart from Jesus. So what would be different for you today as you prepare your mind and heart to come to this table? If you said, Jesus, prepare my heart for this year. Get rid of the junk. I just want to lay it out there. Does that mean you're going to be perfect when you leave this place? By no means. That mean you're going to have it all figured out? That mean you're not going to mess up? No. Nah. But it reminds you that you have a God greater than your sin because of the grace that he offers to all people through the work of his son, Jesus. Because I remember a night when Jesus sat with a bunch of sinners that he called disciples. You hear that? A bunch of sinners that he called disciples. He sat with them and had a meal with them. And he invited to his table every one of them, every one of those scoundrels he invited to his table. The betrayer, the denier, the deserter. You may not like this, but he invites all of us scoundrels to his table. Because we all need the love and grace of Jesus in our heart. To break our heart for what breaks his. So that night, as Jesus sat with his disciples, he took bread and he lifted it up to God. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples, just a few of them, because the others didn't deserve it. No, he gave it to his disciples all all of them he said take and eat this is my body I'm giving it it's not taken from me I'm giving it for you when the meal was over he took the cup he lifted it up to God he gave thanks to God then he gave it to his disciples just a few of them who had washed their hands before the no he gave it to his disciples just some who had no he gave it to his disciples, all, all of them. He said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this often and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord God, in the mighty acts of your Son, Jesus Christ, of salvation, that he offers all people. We come in this place today. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make this bread and this wine be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we, your church, may be the body of Christ, the hands and feet, the eyes, the ears, the mouth. May be the body of Christ, going out into a broken and hurting world as we are redeemed by his precious blood. And God, we do confess to you that we are sinners. We confess to you that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We confess we have not loved our neighbor the way we should love ourselves. We confess we have not heard the cry of the needy. And we confess that when we have heard the cry, we've turned a deaf ear. God, we confess that we are broken and need you. 
Lord, we confess that we invite you, Holy Spirit, to till up the soil of our hearts. To convict us of the rocks and the roots and the sticks that are in the way. That are stopping us from loving you with all that we are. And loving our neighbor where we love ourselves. Amen. In just a few moments, servers will be here at each section of chairs. They will be up front. An usher will invite you to come to receive Holy Communion. The instruction is this, is if you come with open hands, and bread will be placed into your hand. Take the bread, dip it into the cup, place the bread into your mouth. You may circle back to your seat, or you may come to the altar for prayer. Again, the invitation is that Christ invites us all here, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Nothing you've done is so bad that it will not forgive, God's love will not forgive you. If my servers would please come at this time.
slipped away and we simply come grace what a way to kick off the new year with that song reminding us it's all about jesus to say god i'm sorry for whatever i've made it i'm sorry for making religion something that suits me because really what you call us to is relationship not religion to love you with all that we are and to love our neighbors where we love ourselves so it's time for the church to leave the building to let us go let us receive the blessing that is ours this day may the God of infinite love the God of infinite grace go with us his church as we go out into the world empowered through the love of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit Amen. And don't forget committees right here. Sooner we get here, sooner we get done. All right. Let us join hands together.